Well, you know, I'm going to talk about foreign policy. Jeez, must be the first time I've ever brought up the subject of foreign policy on this show. But, you know, I feel a little apologetic sometimes, dwelling so long and so hard on the war in Iraq and all of these other things. But, you know, we kind of played out all of the domestic uh, budget-busting work of the Democrats and Republicans years ago, and foreign policy really does seem to be the most critical area now because we are building enemies of this country, probably a million a day around the world, and we've already paid a horrendous price for it, a price in lives lost by soldiers in Iraq, 3,000 people dying in the World Trade Center attack, enormous, enormous inconveniences. It isn't just the airports anymore. You go into any government building anywhere, you are probably going to think you are in a medieval fortress because you will be searched, you will go through a metal detector, you will have your briefcase checked, all of these things that you will have to go through and you will see armed guards everywhere. And it isn't even the government buildings. Private buildings now, in many cases, are doing this. And, of course, not only are we paying hundreds of billions of dollars for the Homeland Security Department, for the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, all of these other things. Not only are we paying all that, but in the private sector, we are paying billions of dollars through lost time involved standing in line at airports, lost time going through metal detectors, lost time, lost time, lost time, over and over and over again. And you know what? All of this that we are paying in lives lost, in time lost, in money lost, all of this is simply the price we are paying so that our politicians can meddle in the affairs of other countries. That's exactly what all this is about. We are paying this price so that our politicians can have the luxury of telling other countries what to do, so that Ronald Reagan could invade Grenada and bomb Libya and send Marines to Lebanon, so that George Bush Sr. could invade Panama and invade Iraq, so that Bill Clinton could bomb Iraq for eight long years and send missiles to Sudan and Afghanistan and tell other countries what to do, and so that George Bush Sr. could invade Afghanistan and Iraq and go around the world telling you, you have to do this, and you, you have to do that, and we're not going to tolerate this, and we're not going to tolerate that. Just so our presidents and our foreign policy establishment and our national security advisors and all these people can have the luxury of fiddling around with other people's lives, we are paying this enormous price in lives lost and in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars out of the national economy. And you know something? These people who are meddling so deeply into the lives of other countries are, in every case of which I'm aware, absolutely ignorant of what it is they are doing. They have no idea about the culture, the history, the peoples of the countries in which they are meddling. Do you think George Bush knows anything about the history of Iraq? You know how much he loves to lecture us. He loves to say, see, you have to understand, see, they were cooking the books in the corporations. See, Saddam Hussein lied to us. See, Saddam Hussein defied the United Nations. Do you think that if he knew one simple fact about the history of Iraq, that he wouldn't have brought it up in one of his speeches and said, see, in Iraq's history they do this and that? I don't believe so. He has not displayed a single iota of knowledge about the country in which he has invaded and is responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of innocent Iraqis. But that's nothing new. I doubt that George Bush Sr. knew anything about Panama. I doubt that he knew anything about Iraq. I doubt that Bill Clinton knew anything about the Sudan or Afghanistan or the the background of other countries. He may have been a Rhodes Scholar, but he never demonstrated any knowledge whatsoever of foreign countries. I doubt that Ronald Reagan knew anything about any of these countries that he messed around with. I know for a fact that Franklin Roosevelt was contemptuous of all the countries that he intended to save in World War II. History has demonstrated that he considered French people, even though he spoke French himself, he considered French people with utter contempt and that uh, he had very strange ideas about the history of the countries of Europe and so on. And Woodrow Wilson was so ignorant of the future, of the past of, of uh, Europe that at the Versailles Conference, when they uh, were going to fashion the treaty that they were going to impose upon the Germans, all the other allies, the Italians, the French, and the British, just played him for a sucker by feeding him information about the historic uh, positions of these countries. And all we're doing here is restoring what these countries lost in some previous war and so on, when in fact what they were getting is brand new territory that they had never had in that country before. They played Wilson for a sucker. And all these people who talk about making the world safer democracy, the bringing the four freedoms to the rest of the country, bringing democracy to the Middle East, whatever it is, they don't know anything about the countries that they're fooling around with and they're so proud of it and so arrogant about it and just so willing to call anybody who disagrees with them anti-democratic anti-american pro-dictatorship pro-hussein whatever it is that they want to say so foreign policy is very very important we have to do something to change this 
Before we go to the phones, I just have to give you this email. As I've mentioned before, I started a new television show on the Free Market News Network just a few weeks ago, and episode number four went up on the network uh, today. Pardon me, this Saturday went up yesterday. And in it, I had a conversation, debate, uh, whatever, with the Reverend O'Neill Dozier about gay marriage, homosexuality, and so forth. And this prompted Keith in Arizona to send me a note saying, I think I have a solution to the so-called gay problem in America. Since all gay and lesbian people are children of heterosexual parents, we should ban heterosexual relationships. No heterosexual relations, no gays. What do you think about that idea? Oh, I think it's wonderful. It ought to appeal to the Republicans and the Democrats. Very, very funny, Keith. I appreciate that. All right, uh, we have time for one call before our guest arrives, and that call is with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Hey, Harry. Good to speak with you again. You too. Um, I'm somewhat disappointed about something. I'll tell you uh, what it is. I logged on to freemarketnews.com today to see, uh, watch the latest episode of This Week in Liberty with Harry Brown. Yes. And underneath the link, I saw that there was another interview uh, with Congressman John Duncan. Now, I called the show a few weeks ago whenever you had the founder of uh, Free Market News Network on. Yes. And, and I... Yeah. And you, and you uh, quizzed him about how pure this was going to remain, and he reassured you for the moment. Uh, I haven't seen that interview. I tried to watch it myself, but it wants real player, and something's wrong with real player on my system. But the rest of the interviews you can play with Windows Media Player or real player. And so you saw it, and I, I'm expecting the worst, Jonathan. Let me have it. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you, you kind of know what I'm going to say. Um, I really like the idea of Free Market News Network being a, a libertarian uh, news source that's not tainted with Republican or, or Democratic spin. And uh, so I listened to this interview, and here was Congressman Duncan, a Republican from Tennessee, talking about fiscal discipline, talking about how, how terrible the $8 trillion national debt is. And sure enough, I did a quick Internet search and saw that he voted for the new $2.5 trillion federal budget. And uh, the interviewer, John St. George, whom I usually uh, consider to be a, a good uh, uh, person on Free Market News Network, uh, didn't, either didn't know this or didn't care no. to mention it during his interview. No, he, then, he wouldn't know it. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't do research for this. He, just takes, he does take everybody at their word. Okay, that's what, that's what I thought. But anyway, my point is that I really do not... Uh, I really think this is kind of it's kind of hypocritical, and I hope that as president of the network, I don't know exactly what your role is in this, but as president, you would <laughs> do your best to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen again. Well, my job as president is to stand and watch parades as they go by, <laughs> and, um, and, to, and to hold news conferences every once in a while and say, "See, I need to tell you this. I need to tell you that." No, I am going to look into it, and we there is so much material on Free Market News Network that. I couldn't begin to look at it all and still do what I'm doing, which is the TV show, these radio shows, writing articles, and so on. But I do need to, uh, to, to install in some way a kind of monitoring system on this because I know that at the same time, Anthony Weil, who is the true CEO, the chairman of the board of the company, also does not have that kind of time because he's busy creating this network and doing a fantastic job of it. But we do need to have some kind of a system, because I suspect that there, that it isn't just Congressman Duncan. I believe we probably have three or four more ringers in there someplace, and I, I would like to uh, find a way of being able to filter and monitor all of this and, and be able to cleanse it. Uh, Anthony has uh, dropped two or three that I know of, uh, writers from the um, network, before we had the radio and television, when it was mainly just uh, written co commentary, he dropped two or three because uh, of the stuff that they were promoting. You know, and one of them, I remember, was just for bad taste, but a couple of the others were because in the final analysis, what they were promoting is more government as a way of getting us to less government. Mm -hmm. So okay. uh, well, we're, we're both concerned about it, but I, I am very glad you brought that to my attention because, as I say, it just there's something wrong on my computer with the real player system, and as a result, I, I wasn't able to see that, and I was very, very curious, as you probably were, that drew you to it. I was very curious to see what the interview was because the blurb on it said something like, uh, what if all congressmen were like this or something like that? It says free market Republican. Is there such a thing? Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, well, uh, well, as uh, you, you and I know, Jonathan, for years and years and years, Republicans have been campaigning like libertarians and governing like Democrats. Absolutely. And, well, I'm, I'm very pleased with your response to that, and uh, uh, I look forward to hearing the rest of your show. Okay. Thanks for calling, Jonathan. Good to hear from you again. All right. Um, let's see. We've got still got oh, just a couple of minutes before we go to the next break, and after that we'll be talking with Edward Biam uh, Bi Edward Biamonte, excuse me, Mr. Biamonte, for not pronouncing your name correctly. And um, uh, during that time... Let me mention that in the last half hour of the show tonight, I will be uh, talking about uh, something that Fox News had on this past week that you may find of interest. And uh, what is the general subject? Oh, my goodness, it's on foreign policy for a change. Well, that's why I had to tell you in the first uh, segment why I am so concerned about foreign policy. It really is a dastardly thing that is going on. It isn't just 
playing around a little with foreign policy. It's now playing around with not just a few lives, but tens of thousands of lives directly, hundreds of millions of lives indirectly because of the, the reaction that people are having around the world. And in the final analysis, it is playing around with our lives. Yes, those people look like they're Iraqis who are lying dead on the ground on television or on the Internet. But in the final analysis, it is we who are going to have to pay the price for it. We who are going to pay the price because no matter how much security is installed in this country, we know it is government security, and we don't know of a single government program that has ever worked. So we know that security is not going to protect us when terrorists find the means to come over here and cause damage. And it doesn't matter how they keep heightening the security and heightening it in reaction to whatever happens. We are going to pay that price. So we better figure out a way to stop these madmen in Washington from what they're doing. And right now, I want to introduce Mr. Edward Biamonte, who is our guest this evening. Mr. Biamonte, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Well, let me in give you a little introduction here. Mr. Biamonte is the author of the book, Understanding the Difference Between Democrats and Republicans, A Republican Perspective. And if I may, I would like to read the blurb for this book that is on Amazon so we can understand where you're coming from. And then I also want you to uh, confirm or deny that this is a correct um, description of your position. Uh, it says, this is a book designed to answer the most important question in the world. Is it smarter to be a Democrat or a Republican? No matter how much we read, watch TV, study, and debate, we never hear the question asked directly. We are more likely to be shamed into an affiliation with a political party than to come to such an affili affiliation intellectually. Real democracy has become impolite and politically incorrect. It is considered too intellectual, too obvious, or too combative to be a part of normal social intercourse. And it goes on to say, and finally it says, this book is designed to be the one place left where the question that shapes our world and appears each time we enter the voting booth is asked and answered, answered and that question is, is it smarter to be a Democrat or a Republican? Now, uh, is that pretty much your position? Uh, that, that was and is my position, yes. I suspect you probably wrote it. I've, I've written the jacket copy on every book that I've ever uh, had published. <laughs> Well, I guess the secret's out then. We, we both wrote the jacket cover. All right. Now, so I can get this straight. Uh, you're saying, is it smarter to be a Democrat or a Republican? Is that the same thing as saying that Republicans are smarter than Democrats? Well, no. I mean, uh, the first question is simply a question, is it smarter? As you read the book, uh, the, the, the answer is given, namely that it's smarter to be a Republican than a Democrat. And why is that? Because the Republicans believe in freedom. The Democrats do not. All right. What, what is your uh, definition, as best you can articulate it, of freedom? Well, I think it's actually very easy. It, uh, you know, we've had a tendency to complicate it over the years. But I think it really started in history with Thomas Jefferson, and what he meant when he spoke about freedom and liberty was freedom from government. Well, uh, so you need, if you're free, you need to be free from something. Sure. And the thing that has always challenged mankind is government. The thing that we needed to get away from was government, and that's what the Republican Party was founded to do in 1800 when it was first started. Well, you're, uh, you're finding a, a good reception here on that, both from me and I'm sure from most people listening, that government and personal liberty are polar opposites. And the only reason people sacrifice some personal liberty is that they believe that it is necessary in order to preserve the rest of the liberty, but they don't do it willingly in general if they understand that their liberty is actually being sacrificed. But, you know, the Republican Party was founded in the mid-1800s. and it's well, I, have to, I have to disagree with you. You, said, you just said the mid-1800s. Well, the Republican Party that exists today was founded in the mid-1800s. The one that was, I'm sorry to have interrupted, but the one that was founded at the beginning was the Democratic Republicans, which eventually morphed into the Democratic Party, which is quite different from Thomas Jefferson. Nobody will argue that point with you. Well, but, you know, the interesting point is that I think liberals have written that history so that they can claim Thomas Jefferson was their own and claim a lineage that goes back there. But if you read the newspapers of the day and the speeches of the day, Thomas Jefferson thought of himself as a Republican, and that meant someone who believed in freedom from government, and he ran against the Federalists who believed in exactly the opposite. Right. In his State of the Union address, he said in a conciliatory moment, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. But he clearly used the term Republican, a Republican Party, to define the group that he represented. So it seems to me, in terms of the actual... The philosophy of the party, the, the current uh, Republican Party, can trace its lineage directly back to Jefferson without any trouble at all. Well, actually, I would have to disagree with that. The present Republican Party traces its lineage back to the Whig Party, which dissolved, and most of the Whigs then became the new Republican Party, which was not the same party that Thomas Jefferson had belonged to, even though they used the same name. But the important question is, what does the Republican Party stand for today? Uh, do you think that the Republican Party stands for freedom? Oh, I do. I think it hasn't changed since, again, and I know we disagree slightly on this, but since Jefferson started talking about freedom from government, I think that thread has been the most common defining thread in American history, and, it's, and I see it very prominently displayed uh, by George Bush, perhaps not as prominently as I'd like it to, to be displayed, but certainly it's there in very, very obvious form. Well, give me one example of the modern-day Republican Party doing something to make us freer. Well, 
Okay, so the thing that, that I use when I debate people, when I debate Democrats, is I think of the balanced budget amendment. Who supported it? Who did it? It was the Republicans who supported it. How does the balanced budget amendment make us freer? Well, it would, it would dramatically limit the ability of the, government, of the Democrats to continually expand the government to buy more votes and to create new programs that give them a reason for being. But well, would, it, would it also do the same to stop the Republicans from expanding government and giving the Republicans a reason for being? Well, I don't see the Republicans as being interested in expanding government at all. I see them as being for freedom from government. Well, the 2006 George Bush budget, which was submitted a couple of months ago, is 39% higher than the last Clinton budget. Well, that's true, but the, the reason it's true is because they're in power, and to stay in power, they have to compromise with the Democrats. Well, what difference does it make what their reasons are? They're not making us any freer. So they can talk about freedom all they want. Democrats talk about civil liberties and personal freedom, and then when they have the chance, they take them away from us. When Republicans talk about economic freedom, they talk about uh, all kinds of freedoms, but when they're in office, they don't do anything to make us any freer, and they have control of the Congress. They have control of the White House. What's but wait, 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 but that, that, that we know is obviously not true. If they had control of the Congress, we would have all the judges appointed that we want. We would have the balanced budget amendment. We would have Social Security reform. We would have the flat tax. We don't have those things because the Democrats are powerful enough that they can stop them. And they encourage Republicans to adopt their positions in part because that's often the only way they can stay in office. Well, I have to say that about the judges to begin with, the vast, vast majority, and I don't have figures at my fingertips, but the vast majority of ju uh, federal judges in America today are Republicans. Uh, the Congress has already but, approved... But, 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 but we, know, we know that's not true either, because the judges that are appointed, even if they're appointed by Republicans, they aren't the conservative judges that okay, Republicans would uh, really uh, appoint. Hold, hold that thought and finish it when we come back from this break. We're talking with Edward Baimonte. We'll be back right after this break. And before you finish that thought, as I invited you to do, I must... Uh, apologize. I have not mentioned your book since the introduction. It's Understanding the Difference Between Democrats and Republicans. And on my radio links page is a link to the Amazon page where you can read some blur a blurb about it and also some reader comments on the book. And if you like the idea, you can order the book there. And the radio links page you get to just by going to my homepage, harrybrown.org. And right at the top in a group of things that you can go to, one of which is the Radio Links page, where there are links to articles and websites mentioned on the show. There are also a couple of other articles on there having to do with the discussion that we're having tonight, one about the size of the Bush budget and another one about something we might get into yet. Now, I'm sorry that I had to interrupt you before, but when you hear that music, um, <laughs> as the world comes to a stop. I will keep that in mind. All right. And now, you were saying that the problem was that even though most of the judges were appointed by Republicans, they weren't appointed, they weren't conservative. Right. They weren't the judges that they would have appointed had they not had to face a Democratic Congress. But uh, yet, all, all of the programs, everything that the Republicans do, aren't what they would do in an ideal world. They're what they do when they occupy the seats of power in this country and have to compromise with a Democratic country, essentially. Well, first of all, the, the Republican Democratic Congress has already approved over 200 of Bush's nominees for judges, and they are holding up only 10 of them. But th those are the ones that we want the most, and that's why there's <laughs> about to be a huge fight over it. Um, well, what you're saying then is that given the situation as it exists, it's not smarter to be a Republican, not smarter to be a Democrat. It would seem to me that it would be smarter not to vote at all because it really doesn't make any difference. Well, no, I don't think I, I totally fail to see the logic in that statement. It seems to me that the Republicans are within a hair's breadth of opening up this floodgate that could result in a Republican conservative world. And it's not inconceivable that we could get Social Security and that work. That could lead to privatizing everything. So, I mean, he's, he, they're, they're, Karl Rove is brilliantly poking around, trying to find a way in the door. Personally, it doesn't look like he's going to succeed, but they're coming uh, very, I'm sorry, very close. I'm sorry, were you talking about George Bush when you said he? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Bush and Rove are you know, poking around, trying to find a way in the door, and they're coming remarkably close. If it could happen, uh, the world would be a very changed place. But they're, they're certainly, the most important thing is they're coming an awful lot closer than the Libertarian Party. So if I had a suggestion for you, it would be to become a Libertarian Republican uh, and perhaps claim to be the true soul of the party. Well, first of all, the libertarians have no chance of electing a president or even a congressman right now until vast changes take place in the laws no, no, that, it's, that it's, are keeping off the ballot. So they're not really the question. The question is, should we support the Republicans in any way whatsoever, such as, as you say, becoming a libertarian Republican? But George Bush has the power to veto any bill that comes up from this Republican Democratic Congress, and he hasn't vetoed one bill in the four and a half years he's been in office. And why would he uh, propose these gigantic budgets uh, when he doesn't have to do that? The Democrats aren't making him do it. He's just doing it because that's... That's what he wants to do. Well, I would disagree. If you look at the uh, prescription drug bill, for example, that's something that all Republicans hated, but they had to do it and get in 
before what? the before the Democrats did. And so the fight became, how much are we going to spend? Of course, the Democrats wanted bigger government and more spending on prescription drugs than the Republicans. But Karl Rove did the political calculation. They had to do it and take the credit for it. That's the way the nation is. There's, we can't avoid that. Well, uh, George Bush keeps talking about being the leader of the country. And, and during the campaign, he said, I want to lead this country for another four years. And I'm the leader. I have to make these tough decisions and so forth. He doesn't lead at all. Leadership means showing people where they have to go and taking them there, not following them because they because he thinks that he can't get reelected unless he does what he thinks people want, and the Republicans saying, well, this is not what we want at all, but we have to do it because we're not leaders at all, we're just followers. Well, I, I agree to a certain extent, but in, in the end, the actual truth is there's no Republican anywhere in the world who can get closer to these goals than George Bush right now, and that's the best we can possibly do. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand that statement at all. Well, who, who else could have got elected to to get into the White House, to get Republicans elected in Congress, and come as close as we are to passing Social Security reform? There was no other possibility open in the free world. George Bush was the best shot. He may not succeed, but he was the best shot by far of anyone else who might have taken that office. Well, wouldn't you want, uh, and I don't even know whom I'm speaking of, but wouldn't you want somebody that had a little bit more courage than George Bush? He strikes me, especially from what you've said, but also from what I've seen of the last four years, as a kind of sniveling little coward who's afraid to do anything, except uh, go to war with other countries where he doesn't have to pay the consequences, but he doesn't leave the country in any way whatsoever. Uh, I'll give you a chance to respond to that as soon as we come back. And before the break, I said you would have a chance to respond to what I said. I can't remember what I said. Do you remember what I said? Yes, you oh, were criticizing Bush for not being an effective leader. Ah, uh, yes. And my response... I do that so often, I should have remembered that. <laughs> my response is, one, you're, just, you're not being realistic. Politics is the art, as they say, of the possible. Bush is doing the very best he can, given a hugely democratic country. Also, I might point out, that we live in a somewhat libertarian country where power is very much divided, so we're not really susceptible to strong leadership. Our founding fathers set it up so strong leadership wouldn't be possible. And so the likelihood of someone coming from left field and imposing this dramatic new leadership on the country and getting us to a solid libertarian place is very, very remote. It's going to happen incrementally because someone like George Bush or Ronald Reagan is able to slip these ideas into our culture. Well, what, what ideas did uh, Ronald Reagan slip into our culture? Oh, my God. He, he was probably one of the, the greatest forces for freedom since Jefferson. I mean, he stood up and said things that no one had ever said. He said welfare is a form of slavery. He said Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. Uh, he fired the, uh, the traffic controllers right, right out of the box his first day in office. Uh, every time he opened his mouth, he talked about the evil of government. That's something that had, hadn't been done. Uh, in American history since the New Deal. He, the was, he, was a, he was a saint. Now, again, and, the country but, was still a very democratic country, and he didn't really move the world very much, but at least he started saying the right word. But, but what good is talking about it when the government grew by two-thirds and he didn't wield his veto pen to do anything about it? Well, again, it's not that they don't wield it because they don't believe in the ideas. They don't wield it because it'll cost them votes, and in the end, they'll wind up like the Libertarian Party out of power. So but, they're compromising. They're, they're making the system work as best it possibly can for those people who really want to be in power, as opposed to theorists who are content to be outside of power the way you are. Well, that's like saying that somebody just shot me, but he really didn't like murder at all, but he had to do it for some reason, but I'm dead. And, well, and, it's, and it's of no value to me, and it's of no value to me that the government is continuing to grow at such a, an astoundingly fast rate, whether we have Republicans or Democrats in the White House, whether we have Republicans or Democrats in Congress. So I really don't get the point of these people talking about this when they don't really mean it and they're not going to do anything about it. Well, they would do something about it if they had a big enough majority in the government. The, well, the, the, thing that, the thing that's preventing Republicans from delivering on the promise of freedom is they don't have a significant enough majority in government. But, they, they, but they, told us, they told us for so many years, and, and until we have Congress, we can't can't do anything about it. Then they got Congress. They didn't do anything about it. The Democrats are for, are for big government. The Republicans are for making excuses for big government. And you'll have a chance to give us some more of your ideas when we come back after the news. Don't go away, folks. This is Harry Brown. We have gotten quite a few emails, and I'd like to mention one of them, just one, uh, before we go to the telephones, because somebody wants to talk to you on the phone. And that is an email from Matthew out there in Salt Lake City, who says, you might mention that Ron Paul is a Republican. And somehow he is able to vote with a purely libertarian bent. And if I may interject, I'm sure what Matthew means by that is a real, true, small government bent. And then to go on, but yet he has somehow managed to keep in office for many terms. Why can't the rest of the Republicans show this kind of courage? Mr. Biamonte, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, he is obviously an exception, and such an unusual exception that he's irrelevant to our discussion. Well, he's, a, he's an exception only because he's the only Republican in Congress who votes what he claims to believe. 
No, I don't think so. If you look at the, uh, you know, voting voting records are very, very public, and Republicans vote very, very consistently as a block, and they always vote for these major initiatives, the balanced budget amendments, Social Security. We know how they're going to vote. We know how they're going to vote on the judges. I mean, they the parties line up opposite each other. It's not like Republicans vote for Democratic propositions and Democrats vote for Republican propositions. They're, the vote is clearly split. Republicans vote one way, Democrats vote another. If we had enough Republicans in there, the world would change overnight. But we do have enough Republicans. They have a clear-cut majority. It's not even a razor-thin majority. You just mentioned uh, in the last uh, half hour that George Bush uh, led the Republican Party into a great majority in Congress. That wouldn't have been possible without George Bush. So well, they, no. so, I mean, let, let's go over the, the, the recent history. We had a very libertarian country until the New Deal. Then we had a, a liberal majority. And we haven't been able to, to counteract that liberal majority because we've never had a big enough Republican majority in Congress. When that happens, the world would change overnight. The major Republican initiatives can be enacted, but not until there's a significant enough majority to do it. So you're saying that Republicans will not propose or vote for actual reductions in government until they're sure those reductions will pass? Essentially, that's what happens, because, yes, you look very bad. Bush is being very heroic with Social Security, but he's, he's risking all the political capital he's got, and probably in the end he'll regret what he's doing, but he's being very, very brave. Well, I don't consider his Social Security proposal to be all that great. It's telling me that I can take 2% of the 15% they're stealing from me, and I can invest it in ways that George Bush seems to think are all right. Yes, but if he said, okay, let's take 100% of what they're stealing and invest it, he would be driven out of office or impeached. It's just politically not possible. You, Carl, so Rowe, you're Carl Rowe would shoot him if he tried to do that. So you're saying that the American people as a whole want big government? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. All right. Well, at the break... Uh, the next break, we will have one segment after that with you, and I, I'm, I'm sort of sandbagging you here only because this came up late, and you won't really have a chance to respond to it. But I'm going to send you just a Word document I have but, uh, that will show you a number of polls that have been taken in the last, uh, well, since George Bush has been in office, for one thing, where ABC News finds that 60% of the American people prefer a smaller government with fewer services. And you keep going down the line, Rasmussen finds 64% prefer a smaller government with fewer services and lower taxes and so forth. And I realize that people want smaller government in general, and some of them will not want to give up their student loan or this or the other thing. But the fact of the matter that you have this overwhelming distrust, skepticism, uh, disgust with government, and yet the Republicans will not introduce a single bill to do away with the government department or to reduce the overall size of government or in any other way to, to satisfy this hunger on the part of the American people to see something done about their common enemy, which is government, and they think of it as their common enemy, and yet Republicans keep telling us we can't do anything because the American people want this, they've chosen security over liberty, and there's nothing we can do about it, so if there is nothing we can do about it, then why should I care? Well, firstly, the only poll that really matters is the one that takes place on Election Day, and people go in... And since the New Deal, they voted for bigger government. Well, they so could, you can no, ask him inform questions the way he wants and get the answers he wants, but we know what happens in the voting booth. The New Deal is still on, and people aren't willing to abandon it. When did they ever have a choice in the polling booth? Well, they had a choice with Bush. If the country wanted to get behind the balanced budget amendment, the flat tax, privatizing uh, medical care, privatizing Social Security, they could. But no matter what they do, Bush has been traveling around the country since his election, spending his political capital trying to push this concept, and he can't seem to manage it. But it's a heroic effort by any measure. Why didn't he propose this in the first term if it's such a great thing? He, because Carl Rowe said to him, if you do it now, it'll be a disaster. Let's wait until you're on <laughs> firm footing. In other words, wait, wait until you're not worried about re-election anymore. Well, it's a, it, politically, it's incredibly risky, and he's finding that out. And anyone uh, now can look at the situation and say, God, you took a big risk, and it's going to hurt you in the end. It probably was a mistake. But there's not a soul on earth who could have come closer than George Bush. Do you think liberating Iraq was worth the death of 40, 50, 60,000 Iraqi citizens? But personally, I don't. I think it was a mistake. A mistake in what way? Well, I think it, that the heart of the problem in the Middle East, for me, was our support of Israel. And if we had kept our nose out of that situation, or at least been more intelligently involved, uh, we wouldn't have had a terrorist problem to begin with. Do you, uh, think, do you think this has made us freer? The war in Iraq? Yes. No. And, no. The, and the war on terrorism? No. No, I think it was all a, a disastrous political miscalculation. But, you know, foreign policy is a different area. Uh, it's, uh, Republicans and Democrats don't divide as evenly or as neatly on that one. Well, what do you think about the war on drugs? Well, I'm, I'm with you on that. I would like to try legalization for 10 years and then, uh, and then see where we stand. But the, I think... the Republicans are always telling us, bragging about how much they've done, how much they've increased the budget for the war on drugs and so on. Well, I'm with you there. I, I think it's, it's been a disastrous war. It's, it's cost us more than it's gained us, and, uh, and we've got nothing to show for it in all these years. So I'm with you. The government should have kept its nose out of that one, and, uh, and we would have been better off. But again, who could, have, who, could have, who could make that happen? 
Well, well, uh, maybe the same people who started it in the first place. Um, actually, it was Democrats that started it in the 1960s. I mean, that's when they really stepped it up. And then, of course, uh, every president since then has done something about it. Even Clinton. Uh, I debated a U.S. attorney uh, a year or two ago who claimed that if it hadn't been for Clinton uh, moderating the war on drugs, we would have won it by now. But, in fact, Clinton spent more on the war on drugs than George Bush Sr. did. And, uh, and when I say spend it, it was in his budgets to spend more, and the Democratic Congress ratified it. But the point is that we, get, we just keep coming back to the same thing here, that the Republicans and Democrats are doing the same thing, and you're telling us that we should choose between them, and I don't see any point to that. But we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we're talking with Edward Biamonte, and don't go away. Uh, I know that somewhere on my website I put an article about all these polls on smaller government, and I would like to get up there, and if I cannot find it when the show is over, I will go ahead and just make up a page of it and put it on my home page, a link to it. So anyway, by tomorrow, you can link to it. Anybody who's interested in seeing all of these polls, there'll be links directly to ABC News, Rasmussen, um, Harris Poll, Newsweek Poll, Los Angeles Times Poll, all of whom have asked the same question and continually get an overwhelming majority saying they would like to see smaller government with fewer services. Now, let us go to the phone and talk first with James in Oregon. Good evening, James. Good evening, Harry. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. Not a problem. What's up? Well, I would just like to ask uh, Edward uh, Diamante. I think it's that, that's, that's close enough. Okay. Uh, who do you think you're fooling? I mean, the Republicans are for individual liberty? Well, let's talk about the war on drugs. They're saying, I mean, every elected Republican in office, with the exception of Ron Paul, who happens to be a part-time member of the Libertarian Party, and uh, who, by the way, has uh, met with nothing but resistance from the Republican Party, uh, is, is for uh, the war on drugs, uh, telling me and everybody else in America that they know better than I do what I can put in my own body. I eat what yeah, I look, I'm not, I, you know, Harry brought that up. I'm not disagreeing with you on that one. I agree. The government has been wasting its time doing lots of damage with the war on drugs. But that's hardly a central issue of government. It's a trivial issue in the larger perspective. Uh, just ask the million, the million or more people in jail whether it's a trivial issue. A million or more Americans whose lives have been decimated. Well, that's true, and that may seem like a lot. But look at the, look at the uh, 300 million people whose lives are affected by Social Security. That, that affects every living American. has 12.4% of their money stolen every week. So the drug thing may seem big, but this thing is really big. And when you look at the impact that our leadership has around the rest of the world, it's a huge matter of philosophy. The drug issue is relatively uh, trivial by comparison. We well, but, well, wait just a second if I may interject. Two, two points here. First of all, the drug issue doesn't just affect the people who have been put in prison. It affects all of us. Until the war on terror came along, all the wiretapping, all the uh, treasury agents uh, rifling through our bank accounts, all of these other intrusions on civil liberties were chalked up to the war on drugs. Oh, we've got to do this to stop the drugs and so on. All the metal detectors at schools and all these other things uh, were all uh, the, the war on drugs. And then when you talk about Social Security... Wait, wait, uh, one, one at a time. Let, let me respond to that. Sure, go now, ahead. I, I personally don't need drugs, and because we have this law against it, it has no effect on me. So the people who are in jail, you've got to say they're there primarily because they're stupid. It would have been very easy to make the choice to say, I live in a society where these things are illegal, uh, I'm not going to use them and risk going to jail. If they do it anyway, the real problem is that these people are really stupid, not that the government has a silly law. Well, you could say the same thing about taxes. Uh, they're going to pass a, a higher tax rate like Lincoln did. Uh, pardon me, Lincoln. Clinton, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 anyway, as, as Bill Clinton did, uh, ran through a higher tax rate, and I had the privilege of saying, well, uh, given the society, I just go ahead and pay the tax rate, but I don't fool myself to think that I'm living in a society of liberty when I have to change my personal behavior from, uh, from activities that did not harm anybody else, but I can't do them anymore more in order to stay out of jail. That's not really an argument for anything, I have to say. But with regard to Social Security, I would like somebody to name, and I'm still waiting to hear this after years and years of asking, name one government program that started out as a small step toward liberty and ever made a second step. Uh, and on the contrary, they all turn out to wind up being bigger intrusions on our liberty than they were. And I can almost guarantee you that if George Bush gets through this program, which I do not consider to be any great shakes at all, that 2.4% can be put into investments that George Bush puts the stamp of approval on, but supposing it goes through, I can almost guarantee you the Social Security rate will be 18% within the next three or four years. Well, it's possible that there, there may be some uh, difficult medicine to swallow while we're in this transition period, uh, but it's still an awful lot closer to getting where we want to be than, 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 uh, than we're going to get by listening to the libertarians who have no power whatsoever to do anything. And let me also say, it's an absolute falsehood to say Democrats and Republicans are doing the same thing when they're voting very differently in Congress. And the result and is the same. The result may be the same, but voting doesn't guarantee results. But a vote is a different kind of behavior uh, than the voting. Republicans vote very differently than Democrats, which has got to mean that they're very different in lots of fundamental ways. And for you to pretend that that difference doesn't exist and that it ultimately couldn't be translated into action if there were a sufficient majority of Republicans in the Congress is a falsehood. I mean, I realize that you do it because that leaves you as the alternative, but it really is misleading. Well, no, no, no. I don't. I'm not promoting the Libertarian Party. I have said over and over and over again that the only choices I see are to vote Libertarian or don't vote at all. But I'm not out flogging the Libertarian Party. Well, what would happen if, if the Republicans had a 75% majority in both houses of Congress? 
Well, we'd hear more excuses than we hear now. I don't think so. I think we'd have a free society. Every time they get a bigger uh, return, we get bigger excuses than we had before. And, uh, you know, we were just waiting. It, it was beyond belief that we would ever have a Republican Congress. And then we finally got a Republican Congress, and somehow or other, nothing materialized. Well, we, we need the White House. Then we had the White House and a Republican Congress. Now they're telling us, well, we don't have enough conservative Republicans. Well, that's quite different from saying we needed more Republicans. Now we've got guys like Ted Stevens in Alaska who's spending billions of our dollars on bridges that go nowhere in Alaska. And we got the chairman of the um, House uh, Transportation Committee, Schuster, in Pennsylvania, who is diverting billions of our dollars to Pennsylvania for roads that probably don't go anywhere either. And all of these other projects, and they are nothing but boondogglers like the Democrats are. Well, we, we, those aren't the guys we mean. We don't mean guys like that. We mean guys that will do something for liberty. Well, I don't see any of those other than Ron Paul and maybe barely people like Jeff Flake who, who take tentative steps in that direction. But as the... Uh, you, know, you said you have to look at the way they vote, though. They vote very differently. But that's got to mean that they think very differently and that they would have very different programs. Then why don't they win any of these votes? We'll because be back. they don't have the majority, period. They do have the majority. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, and then we'll talk with Matthew in Utah. James, thanks for your call. We'll be right back. Right now, let's go to Utah and talk with Matthew and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Matthew. Uh, hello, Mr. Brown. What's up? I, uh, I have to agree with your guest in one aspect, in that uh, he's correct that on some issues Republicans seem to uh, vote cohesively, uh, particularly with the uh, latest uh, thing with the reimportation of drugs from Canada. They seem to be unanimous against allowing that, which, which really isn't surprising because it's just an extension on the war on drugs, which says we know better, better than, than you what you should be able to ingest, what you should be able to take, and even if it's not recreational drugs, if it's, if it's uh, drugs to help... Uh, with your heart problems or whatever, they're going to decide, not you, and that is completely against liberty. <laughs> Second of all, I completely uh, disagree with the Republicans' excuses about having to compromise with the Democrats to gain political capital. If it's absurd as, as somebody running a concentration camp in uh, Nazi Germany and saying that you have to kill a few Jews to gain favor with Adolf Hitler to stay in power so he can then go ahead and save a few of the other Jews, because if somebody else were in power, then... then uh, and they would kill all of them. Look, either you have to make a moral, either it's completely moral, morally reprehensible that you steal people's money and take it and spend it on most politically well-connected people in Washington. Either it's right or it's wrong. You cannot make an excuse. You cannot make a compromise. You cannot make a deal with the devil, or you will never make any progress in fixing the problem. Uh, all right. What do you want to say about that, Mr. Bayot? Well, okay. it, it sounds nearly insane to me. I mean, you can be as principled as you want, and what that would mean is that you'd be a libertarian, and it wouldn't matter what principles you had because nobody would listen. It's just that simple. So go kill somebody. I mean, but, but, but wait a second. This whole thing started on the premise that Repub uh, it's smarter to vote Republican than Democrat. But you're excusing the fact that the Republicans never accomplish anything by saying that if you're a libertarian, you don't accomplish anything either. No, but, but, that, but we're not you talking about... You're, you're not even playing the game if you're but a what libertarian. Difference, but what difference does that make to the argument that because Republicans are smarter than... Because eventually you can win, and the Republicans are awfully close to winning. They're within a hair's breadth of winning. You don't accomplish anything. Well, because, you, well, I'll, well, I'll believe that when you do one single thing. And you've got a majority. Just pass no, one they bill. They have done things. They, you know, the House voted to kill the death tax just the other day. That's that's a, that's one single little tiny thing, but it's a big yeah, thing. Bush is, going to, Bush is going to propose privatizing Social Security in legislation in June. That's a little thing. That's huge. That's a ton more than the Libertarians are doing because the Republicans are playing the game. The Libertarians are standing on the sideline on principle. Look, okay, forget the Libertarians. Your argument, your book is not entitled Understanding the Difference Between Republicans and Libertarians. It's Democrats. And you keep telling us that we would be better off with Republicans and Democrats. I don't see it. Well, if they vote absolutely different. Of course, you'd have a different, a totally different world if Republicans were in power. So to say that there would be no difference is simply flat out flying in the, in the face of the obvious facts. You mean it would be better if only Republicans voted differently, and therefore I should be uh, in favor of what the Repo I don't. God, I, I can't even repeat that. I don't understand it. If Republicans had a majority, a bigger majority in Congress, the world would be a totally big? different place. How big? Big enough to pass the legislation that they want. But they have a majority in most thirds. Two thirds would get them over every hurdle that they faced on every major piece of legislation in the last ten years. What? What? what give me an example the of a hurdle. Budget amendment. Yeah, no, no, no. Give me an example of a hurdle that stops a majority in Congress from passing a bill. Well, the filibuster on the. On that's that's the, on one issue. Well, the filibuster stops them from using their majority to get the nominees they want on the court. That's, a, that's one issue, and it, and it does not have anything to do with larger or smaller government. It, it has does, to... it does, because they, that, that's why the Democrats are filibustering the nominees. Every, every legislation, every piece of legislation can be filibustered in committee, so it never comes out. So you're saying that if the Republicans propose to actually cut government, the Democrats would filibuster it to death? Right, one way or the other. So why, they, don't you try, why don't the Republicans try, try it and then go to the people and, and complain about that instead of complaining about a bunch of judges who will probably uh, legislate from the bank uh, from the bench just the way the Democrats do, because that's what Republicans have been doing as well. The, the, the well, terrible... what the Republicans have been doing, excuse me if I can interrupt you, sure. they, they've been proposing tax cuts. 
because that's something relatively easy to sell to the American people. And, and, it's, and it's meaningless. Well, no, because they're, they're holding the line. For example, just the other day, they voted to kill the death tax. Right. But what, they, what they can't do is kill the programs. The spending they can't stop because that's politically unpopular, and they would be out of office. It's so we're not getting a low, so we're getting a full low. But it's not politically unpopular, and it's the only thing that means anything. It doesn't mean anything to kill the death tax. All you're doing is rearranging the cost of big government. Only when you reduce the spending are you and, and the intrusions well, but uh, are you actually you cannot, reducing government. Re politically, right now, you can't reduce spending, and they're not doing it. They would love to, but they can't. Ma Matthew, do you have any, any last thought? Matthew, do you I, have I, I've been interjecting here about every five minutes. I know, and I keep uh, uh, <laughs> drowning you out. Uh, go ahead, Matthew. I, it, it, just, it just goes back to the same thing. If you guys can't make any difference, there's absolutely no point in voting for you at all, because if I vote for you, you're going to, as Harry Brown always says, you're going to interpret that as endorsing every big program that you have proposed, and you will never feel any sort of pressure to change. And the same thing is happening to George Bush. He had absolute control over the budget. He could have cut anything he wanted, and he could have gone in there just like Ronald Reagan did sort of when he first went in there. Well, the truth is, Bush can't cut any spending without paying a huge political price. Anything, it doesn't matter. If he has principles, it won't matter. It you know, we, we, uh, this is the man of courage and character that we're talking about here. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes for our last segment with Mr. Biamonte. Before we go back to the phones, let me ask you a question following up on what Matthew said. In your blog, what percentage of the blog, of your comments on the blog, would you say have been critical of what the Republicans in Congress and the White House are doing? Uh, probably 5%, 5 to 10%. All right. As long as there are people like you who do not criticize the Republicans, what incentive do they have to change? They know that you will support them, whatever happens, because you'll say it would have been worse with the Democrats, so they can continue to increase the government by 10, 7, whatever percent every year. They can continue to make new intrusions based on the war on terror or the war on drugs, and they know that you're not going to do anything to stop supporting them. Well, that's not true, because you know, there are always Republicans to pick between. So when an election comes up in my district, I pick the most Republican of the Republicans. And so there's always a process uh, going on where you're moving the party further and further to the right to the extent that's politically possible. If it were possible for me to be a purist and go vote the, the pure uh, Republican line or the pure libertarian line, I would do it, but there's no market for it, so nobody's doing it. What you're doing is incrementally moving the government in the direction that you want it to move. And that's the way our founding fathers intended the government to work. It doesn't move quickly. It moves very, very slowly. Always in the wrong direction. Well, so far, that's, that's been the sad case since the New Deal. All right. Nick in New Hampshire, uh, can you give us a quick uh, question or comment? Uh, we, we don't have a lot of time, but I uh, do want to hear from you. All right. Yeah, I'll start real quick. Uh, first of all, Mr. Uh, Baimonte, uh, yeah. I do appreciate you coming on the show and debating Mr. Brown, and uh, I think, you know, exchange of ideas is really, you know, it's important. Thank like you very that. much. But so far, you know, let's just put aside the whole entire economic issue, you know. Even if you take on face value that Republicans in the heart of heart are more fiscally responsible for smart government, even if you, like, assume that, which I do not assume, but just take it, let's just say that they do. Right. So all the issues, social issues, personal issues, things that inter interfere with our personal lives, well, they are arguably as bad, if not worse, than the, Repub than the Democrats. I mean, you have to consider all the things. You say, oh, two million people in jail, that's no big deal. Well, yeah, maybe to you or I, but you know, on the issue of war and drugs, you know, we have a Republican administration with a Republican Justice Department prosecuting people for growing pot in their backyard. After California, yeah, well, but, but it's illegal. Oh, so why, don't, why don't they just find something else to do? And no, 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 it's about freedom. It's about freedom. I could go and say, you know, these gun nuts, you know, who own guns and stuff like that, you know, they don't, you know, they're stupid, but... They have a right to own guns, just like people have a right to smoke, people have the right to have sex with whatever they want. I, I agree, and, that, I but, agree. Okay, but you know what? I'm not going to go out there and defend Democrats and saying, oh, well, you know, they, just, you know, therefore, like, you know, free lifestyle, you know, free love and stuff. But, oh, well, you know, they, you know, about the guns, you know, they, they believe in gun control, but I can, I can give that up because, you know, they're willing to fight for my right to smoke pot. I mean, that's, you don't excuse either party. And I think the fact that you, you go and you make it such a small issue, that just shows that the Republicans, in the heart of hearts, do not really care about freedom, neither do the Democrats. And, you know, it's not just one drug. It's the Patriot Act. It's the FCC and the censorship. for someone you're showing their breasts on television. It's about gay marriage. It's about telling people who they can and cannot marry, which was not decided by the federal government. That was decided, that's something that for years, for centuries and centuries, you know, private institutions and religions have decided for themselves who can get married. And now you have the government coming and saying, here's who can marry. And it was a state, okay. thing is, it was a state issue. Even if you say, well, states right. have the right to do that. It was okay. a state issue. And now you have the federal government coming in and saying, like, well, we don't like the idea that some people are letting get married. It's not, we're going to define it. We're going to amend the Constitution. Well, you know, wait, it's a sad thing that, you know, when our country was formed, uh, the, the moral issues weren't taken into account because we had a very strong uh, religious background and the church really gave us those values and everybody accepted them and there wasn't much debate about it. Now that religion is dead, uh, that's, that's the problem. Religion, 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 religion is dead and the government is going to take its place and I don't think that there's any way around that. So you might as well get used to that. It's and, not uh, the lack of religion, well, though. Okay, Nick, we got it. And I, sure. I just, I've got to comment on one thing and that is when you say those people were stupid. They shouldn't be in jail, but they were stupid to break the law. Well, you could say the same thing about the people that Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein killed. If they hadn't been stupid, they would have gone along with what Saddam Hussein wanted and they wouldn't be dead. Uh, that's really no argument at well, all from no, somebody it, who it, says it, that he's it, for it, personal it, liberty. One, one can decide to give up marijuana or cocaine or whatever they're doing, and they ought to be mature enough and intelligent enough to have a very meaningful life without it, rather than to do it and risk the, the incredible uh, uh, confinement that you face for having done it. It's a very different thing. 
No, it's not a different thing because you're supposed to be on the side of liberty. Now, if you were one of those dumb no, Democrats, not, or, I, or I, if I you were legalize, George Bush, I would legalize drugs. But I'm not going to sit here and, uh, and, and and compromise my belief in the Republicans over a trivial issue like drugs when the way around it is don't use drugs. Find something else to do with your life. Don't well, if you were if you were George Bush or one of those dumb Democrats, what you're saying would make sense, but it's not coming from somebody who claims to be for liberty. But I do thank you very much for coming on. This hasn't been the most pleasant experience in the world for you, and I appreciate that you did it. Uh, and for you folks, uh, we'll be back with some closing words right after this break, so don't go away. One of the things I was going to talk about tonight uh, in this last half hour was that the State Department uh, came up with a report that terrorist acts increased tremendously around the world in 2004. So Bush saying that the world is safer is a lot of just hyperbole. And so that's one of the things that on the Radio Links page, and I'd like to encourage you to go there. Just go to harrybrown.org and then click on Radio Links, and you will see Mr. Biamonte's material, but you'll also see that poll, a link to that poll, Do People Want Smaller Government? And I really do want to encourage you to take a look at it. It may change your outlook on the prospects for liberty in America. And then there's also a link to an article about the Bush budget being much bigger and uh, a link to my television show and all kinds of things. So take a look there. And, of course, if you're not familiar with my website, there are a ton of articles on there, uh, not just about foreign policy, but all sorts of things. And there's a topical index so that you can look up articles on any subject that you want. My apologies to all the people who sent emails that I did not get to tonight. Uh, they all were critical of the position that the Republicans are something we should be supporting. And it comes back again to what I have said and that uh, Matthew brought up, that if you vote for them, you are telling them that they do not have to change, that what they're doing is just fine. They are not going to say, I got elected because I was the lesser of two evils. No, they're going to say, I got elected because they like what I'm doing. They like the fact that I voted for that pork. They like the fact that I voted for the war in Iraq. They like the fact that I voted for the drug war. And on and on and on and on and on. So to me, the only alternatives are vote libertarian or don't vote at all. Anything else is a vote for big government, no matter what you would like to say the vote is for. All right. Do have a good week this week. Do something nice for yourself and your family. And I mean it. And take it to heart this week. All right. See you next week. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much for tuning in.